Hey, very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. My name is Sean. This is Alex. And you're listening to a new episode of Coaster Kings Radio. Today we've got a fun topic, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Because um, even though Sven may not be here, uh, we miss you, Sven. We have um, this question that we're kind of asked ourselves, and then we ask everyone else. That question is... Is Universal better than Disney? And we're going to sort of try and answer that question. And we know their preferences are preferences, and yes. so... It, this isn't necessarily a like better. It's too situation, objective. Yeah, it, it. But we feel like Disney kind of gets the spotlight all the time. And historically, obviously, Disney has a longer history of, of theme park magic. But Universal does a couple of things really well and different that I, you know I wish Disney did. Yeah. So today we're going to take some of our audience's responses from Instagram, and we're also going to take our own points that we come up with, and we're going to just kind of see like, well, in what ways is Universal yeah. better? We want to unpack um, today's topic. all of the things that are elevating the universal experience in a way that maybe Disney could learn from. Um, how do we want to start with this? We've got a well, lot of points. Well, before we dive into that, yeah. we're actually going to start off with uh, with a little, you know, news and... and oh, uh, yeah. Sort of okay. Segment. Yeah, we'll do news. Um, so since we're recording, this actually pretty close to release date. Sometimes there's a little bit more of a buffer between recording and releasing. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, recorded This is an week. opportunity to do something, so, some topical. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of news points that kind of tie into what we discussed earlier. So uh, if you may remember a couple episodes ago, we mentioned the dragon at Ocean Park being one of seven attractions that I got going to be closed due to uh, a new business model the park will be approaching with individual fenders and operators um half free admission half like paid ticketing system and so um somewhere within the next three years dragon was going to close however it turns out dragon already closed yeah this week dragon got the boot yeah. closed off the website no longer operating mm-hmm. um a little quicker than I would have hoped for. Yeah. In my mind, I was like, well, three years they gives me time plug. to go back and they go. They pulled the plug quick because it was January when we were given the latest on yeah, our February, Ocean maybe Park. Even. Well, yeah, didn't we post our, our... I was looking at the article today. It yeah. was January 28th when we posted the our Coaster Kings article uh, about the, the 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 Ocean Park Hong Kong address. Yeah, yeah. So April, yeah, January, January yeah, 18th. 18th, yep. yeah. Um. Because yeah, after I because it, and my roller coaster database is, has it as re- re- retired. Like it's it's pretty much, you know, I I trust I re- I trust the database. I'm assuming they went through uh, their their necessary channels to um, confirm the status of this right. And we've had other people talking about it, and they're like, yeah, it's 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 toast. But um, all is not lost. I mean, the park I think has a great future. It's just a matter of um, keeping what works and retiring stuff that is not pulling its weight. And unfortunately, I mean, it's no surprise. It's been rumored for a long, long time. I mean, when we wrote it in 2018, we were like, I'm glad we're getting our rides in because, like, we don't know how much longer this ride has. It could be any day they they might throw the uh, throw the axe down. Yeah, financially, the focus is really shifting on getting the water park open, which they've been under construction for years. Mm-hmm. It's located kind of like in a blown-out portion of the hill, um, indoor, outdoor, several-level water park. Really, really cool, very modern. However, they honestly just don't have the funds to complete it, so they've yeah. got funds, and then they reapplied for funds, and now in order to get this funding, they're going to open and do a new business model. So the first to get the boot is Dragon. So you're here, you're hearing mm-hmm. it. Um, unfortunately, you no longer have the chance to go out and write that. We're sad so about sad. it, too. It is what it is. However, people in California finally get a chance to write something. Yep. Um, it looks like the parks in California are uh, getting the green, lit, or green light to open. Yes, we're very excited to first see. First parks that we've got dates for and that are opening up are going to be Six Flags Magic Mountain and Six Flags Discovery Kingdom with rides operating starting April 1st. Uh, Magic Mountain is doing a um, pass holder preview on the 1st and 2nd. And then Ooh, starting the 3rd, everyone is able to come in. Yep. You just got to make sure you have a valid ticket or pass type as well as a reservation. Uh, more information on the coasterkings.com. Um, and, of course, Disneyland Resort, you know, um, the last Disney park that hasn't seen in a single operating day um, with rides since COVID-19 closures last March. They are opening both parks, Disney's California Adventure Park and the Disneyland Park, on April 30th. I can't believe it will have been closed for one year, one month, and two weeks. It is wild. And How is that It's also kind of wild is the fact that uh, Disney's only reopening the um, Grand Californian Hotel. Um, at this time, in fact, the villas aren't even opening till after the parks have opened. So the only hotel that's opening with the parks is going to be Grand Californian Standard Rooms. However, 
Um, again, the, the villas and vacation club rooms will be opening up sort of shortly after. And then we'll just have to see when they are ready to accept guests to the Disneyland Hotel as well as the Paradise Pier Hotel. Now, based on the fact that they're going to be running an incredibly low um you know, occupancy, there is definitely a chance that that's why the hotels is there's just no need to open hotels for guests that can't even go into the park or anything. So do we have an update from Cedar fair about their parks in California? Um, as of right now, um, I, unless I missed it, I don't have anything on knots. And we know that, um, Great America's opening is already announced, and I believe that was for May. I mean, didn't they announce it, like, a couple months? Yeah, they announced or, or, like it. Like, they announced prematurely. it with a bunch of other, kind of just, like, a, a general... I guess we can look this up right now. But, yeah, uh, I expect uh, Knott's Berry Farm so Yeah, it looks like California's Great America, Great America is still listed to it'll be opening up on the 22nd of May. May. So... Yep, that's that probably won't change. I'm guessing. Yeah, I don't think yeah, they're gonna rush since they've that. already. Yeah, and you gotta do a hiring and stuff still, especially for re- especially for seasonal parks. Yeah. It's gonna be a little harder. Um, and then um, for those that haven't quite heard, but I'm sure if you listen to to our podcast, you're aware, is that Dollywood has opened Lightning Rod with the new majority Iron Horse track. track. Yeah, it's now more than fifty percent of the ride is Iron Horse track. So I guess you could call it and a hybrid of a hybrid. They did a major reprofiling on the quad down, so like the shape of it is actually changed. It's not even the same uh, shape, I guess. Like the profile of the the final hop on the quad down is like banked and angled differently, probably to uh, reduce the stress points that they had. Um, and it's funny you mentioned stress points and like reducing them. Uh, <laughs> same park, Mystery Mind. Mystery Mind um, has been a trouble trouble boy for yeah. quite a while when it comes to the, um, you know, like the mini ninety degree drop mid ride yeah. that goes into the horseshoe. Yeah, that horseshoe, horseshoe has been is replaced. Gone. The drop is gone. So yeah. now first you turn into kind of like a hairpin kind of turn. And it drop. did. It it's been open for a few days. It didn't open with the park, but it was testing when the park opened. Then I think it yeah, opened. I mean, the park just opened like last week. I think. Yeah, so it's so cool. Um. But yeah, I guess the story with the horseshoe was that Gershlauer was designing with an additional third party that was operating on behalf of Hershen Family Entertainment, and there was compromises between the Hershen camp and Gershlauer uh, design-wise and what they thought made sense, and this being pretty early in the, uh, I guess, in the gestation of the Gershlauer ride style. Well, yeah, because that ride it was quite yeah, already. It so. was very prototypey. And they said that just for the future of the ride, the horseshoe wasn't working out, putting too much stress on the side friction wheels. Though it is funny that it took that long for it to happen. Yeah. But hopefully now this means the ride either has the opportunity to add new trains. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, or it'll just run smoother. Because so. as far as I know, it was going to be an issue with the wheel assemblies forever. And they weren't. there was no incentive for them to invest in new trains if this horseshoe thing was going to continue to be a problem for the wheel assemblies, regardless of what trains it ran. So now that they've made this change, maybe then we've opened the door uh, to new trains. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yep. And then um, we don't necessarily have articles about these things on our website. Um, besides oh, reopening information on uh, Six Flags uh, Parks in California. However, a couple things we do have on our website is there's an amazing zoo, one of the largest zoos in the world, actually. that has um, an incredible resort setup where rooms are facing or inside or are inside exhibits it's called the uh, paradise it's located in belgium it is one of the most spectacular um, attractions i've ever seen um, we have a full detailed report including a look at the hotels on the coast kings.com so despite it not really being coaster related it's something you definitely want to check out um we also are going to start our how-to series so um we're kind of just diving back into all the trips we've had and looking at things that we learned along the way, it's like, wow, it would have been useful to know beforehand. And the first article we're going to be launching is How to China. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be taking a look at coming there as a tourist, not just doing parks, but also just helpful tips when you want to see other things. The because world while is you're there, right? reopening, so it's time. Now is the time to start planning, thinking about your next international park excursion. Because by the end of this year, things could be pretty much a free-for-all. 
So yeah, we definitely hope for that. With any, um, with any luck. And if you're going to go explore the world, yeah. um, we also have a 20 best Disney rides article live. So go check out which parks need to be next on all your list. All Disney rides In fact, in we're also list. having an episode coming up where we rank all 12 Disney parks. Um, that should be launching yeah. um, within a month. So that'll be really exciting. Mm-hmm. And then um, our That's Lost Coasters. That's a fun one because I feel like it changes every time we go to a d- new Disney park or a park that we haven't been to in a while. We update. Well, like yeah, we do changes. update the list annually if we yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have the Lost Coasters of California articles and podcast episodes that are weekly, like a mini series mm-hmm. by our uh, correspondent Ian. So definitely check that out. Mm-hmm. And then we've had two really, really, really fun episodes with Sven. Um that we didn't for Ghost Against Radio the last couple of weeks, including uh, the Hot or Not, which are 60 categories that were f- voted on by thousands of people on Instagram. And we're just kind of deciding what's hot and what's not. That mm-hmm. was a good episode. And then we had one where we looked at the best rides yeah. and their worst reviews. Bad reviews of good rides. Yeah, so that, that episode is called so Good fun. Rides, Bad Reviews. So go yeah. back in our catalog if this is one of your first episodes you're listening to. Uh, make sure you don't miss those. So much fun. And with that, All we're right. going to go ahead and dive into dive today's into topic. Our topic. What makes Universal great? Should we be playing the Universal theme song here? <laughs> it's probably copyrighted. Okay, we're not doing it. <laughs> we were singing it in the car earlier. We did a pretty good rendition of like the Universal pictures. That's an exclusive but to we're us. Gonna, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to spare you that because it was fun for us. It might not be fun for anyone besides us. So yeah, first we were thinking, well, what if we just like gave an answer and yeah. then worked our way back? But I think we realized that okay, well, this is objective. Uh, you know, maybe we're in the Universal mood one day, and the next day we're in a Disney mood and living in Orlando. Right. Actually, we swing back and forth all the time. So instead of being like, well, which one is actually better? It is completely a taste thing. They are two different products, mm. but because you could say yes I, for a lot of reasons, sure. you could also say no for reasons. Exactly. But, but then there's also the fact that. Well, Disney is kind of like regarded as the number one, even though Universal, I think, is trending yeah. right now more than Disney it's is. It's always the underdog because their journey to global theme park dominance started, you know, in the 90s, whereas Disney, it started, you know, two decades prior. Um, but we feel like for all the times that Universal was underestimated, they are at times quietly and other times not so quietly clawing their way up to uh, a similar level of prowess as uh, the Disney parks and resorts. So that's really what we want to talk about here. Um, We've talked a lot about it when we think back to our visits to Universal Studios Hollywood and Universal Studios Japan and then our time as a pass holder. Really, if you're a Floridian, you might feel differently about Universal versus Disney versus if you're from Southern California or if you're from Japan. It could be different. Every market they're in, yeah. and even with like Beijing opening, that's going to be different. And in a way, yeah. we'll, we'll also kind of draw some parallels between Hong Kong and Singapore, Singapore. Um, based on you know money, audiences, um, projects for Execution. each of the, of the company. Yeah. And then even Universal's um, Port Aventura, which is no longer Universal mm, property. Universal Mediterranean. Um, but we've got lots to talk about. So we're just going to kind of go from topic to topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to start with the park sizes. So Universal technically has fewer resorts, mm-hmm. fewer parks. Yeah. Definitely. They've only got six parks. Please hold. Well, yeah, they've got, uh, well, they only have five parks that are open, not counting Volcano Bay, which. Volcano Bay is, people will say one way or the other, Volcano Bay really qualifies as like the third gate. Um, well, yeah, that's so another thing that's up for you. Par- yeah, like five, five theme parks with the five sixth dry opening parks, like next month. Five yeah. parks with coasters and dark rides that are open with, uh, uh, Beijing will be number six compared to Disney's 12. So yeah, double the parks for Disney pretty much. However, Disney has a tendency to build second gates and have them be like half the experience. They're at best. a little underdeveloped. As for Universal, a underbaked has some incredibly developed theme parks. So, for example, if we're gonna take a look at Universal Studios Japan, we'll throw the one out there first. Mm-hmm. Um, that resort feels like it could have been two gates. Yeah, lots and lots to do. Massive park, and now that you know Potter is all the way in the back with like a long walkway to get there, and then behind that now. They built Mario, so you know um, Super Mario Kart. What? Yeah, the Super <laughs> Koopa Challenge. Yeah. Uh, you know Super Nintendo World. Is that what it is called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good example to be like, wow, this could have easily been two gates. If yeah. they had split the park USJ down in the middle, it would have been two gates. It's easily. easily like it's USJ is up there with like Europa Park in terms of like 
what you can do in one gate. Um, Disney, meanwhile, like Disneyland in Anaheim is still the most like rides per square foot type of Disney park, and that's kind of an exception um, to the general rule. Well, I would say the Magic Kingdom parks all have a ton of rides, but not quite as many as Disney Disneyland does. But I feel like our Magic Kingdom really doesn't have that many rides per capita, like relative to its size and its attendance compared to like the other dis like the, all the Disney lands. Uh-huh. Because I feel like there's other... They just have to spread... They're spreading everything across those four parks, and no one park in Disney World has as many rides as all of the other Disney lands, I think. Sure. Because those Disney lands are making up either 50% or 100% of the respective resorts ride roster, um, whereas with the Magic Kingdom, it's only 25%. You anything to add to that? <laughs> I'm waiting for you to finish. I'm thinking. I'm like, um, but yeah, I guess for us, with the park size, it's important to think about fleshing out parks, having products. Disney has such a reputation for building these parks that are full of potential. And like, look, potential is great, but if it takes 20 years for you to bring your gate up to a full day status, like a park like uh, Hollywood Studios or, or Animal Kingdom just felt like half-day parks for so, so long. And only in this era, like in this decade, have they both achieved a point where they're like, okay, like I would spend my whole day here. Like there's enough to do um, to, for this to be a full park. Whereas Universal, Universal only has one second gate. Obviously, the other studios parks, the four operating studios parks, are big and massive in their own right, and they carry the, they carry the crown. And I know what, I know what you're thinking, guys. Like if you're thinking, well, Universal Studios Hollywood is really small, and especially it used to be like way small. You also got to think of the fact that Universal Studios Hollywood has a unique ad, edge, and we'll, yeah. we'll dive into it a little yeah. bit later. It's that they have the studio tour, which isn't easily about a two hour commitment, including queuing. The studio and tour accounts for like three rides, and <laughs> the studio tour has like all these things along the way that are like highlight attractions that yeah. have just worked into the tour. And so that and having the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, the lower lot, now they're adding Super Nintendo World. Yeah. You have there is their, their show lineup is cool because Water World's really good. I would say like now you can easily spend a full day Universal. Yeah, I've never thought that ever at least since Potter was built. I'm like, okay, Potter. Yeah, because I remember this going to like park. I remember going to like 2013 when um, Transformers was brand new and there was you know three rides in the lower lot. There was a studio tour and it was like one ride in the upper lot. Yeah, I mean this is before Minions. And now we got Su- thing, Secret you know? Life of Pets is opening. Yep, Secret Life of Pets opening. So yep. I'm I'm I yeah for me all even, even the smallest yeah. of the studios parks still feels like a full day park without question. And then for Florida, you have the only second gate in the Universal Lexicon, which is Islands of Adventure. And from day one, Islands of Adventure opened and took the crown from Studios Florida. It was, like, exactly what happened with Disney Sea at Tokyo Disney Resort, where, like, you opened the second gate, and it was such an amazing, like, slam dunk that your second gate immediately became your first priority. But overall, the point of this is, is that despite um, Disney kind of having double the amount of parks, if you're going to look at, like, well, which parks are fully fleshed out, they both have six fully fleshed out parks. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, well, Universal... It puts a lot more quality and a lot less space. Get, That's where yeah. Disney loves to drag it out. Just you get more bang for your more, gate. Even you if know? you pay more to get into that gate, you get a full gate. Yep. Um, the, Next up is the yeah. resort size, which kind of bleeds into yeah, that. Yeah, going so. from park size to just the size of the resorts. So, like, the resorts, again, Disney resorts are, are larger. No denying that. But are they convenient? I mean, well, this world's by no means convenient. Yeah. And honestly, what we mention all the time is that it's too large for its own good. Mm-hmm. Um, try and maintain a park the size of Man- those is like twice the size of Manhattan. Yeah. And like the size of the city of San Francisco is what they say. Yeah, the Skyliner, Skyliner spiel. Um, it's hard to maintain that. And everywhere you look, you know, maybe you won't really notice if it's your first time going or you don't go frequently. But if you're a pass holder, you can be yeah. like, okay, well... Come on, guys. Disney like, World this needs to get fixed. has a lot of that so happens. much on its plate. It's got a lot of things in the air at all times. And no, while it's spectacular to be this large, yeah. maybe it's not necessarily the right Being solution. Being large, and, just, and even just like the sheer distances between parks, the time th- that you have to budget for park hopping is a uniquely Disney World problem because 
other resorts like Anaheim and Paris, park hopping is super easy. Those are by far the easiest. And then in yeah. Tokyo, park hopping isn't really, really even a thing park unless you a buy a three or four day ticket. Because the way their ticketing is set up, it's like you get one yeah, full day so, at one park, one yeah, full day Yeah, so the it's other. really cute that all these resorts have several gates, but yeah. how convenient is it actually? And yeah. how well is the second gate fleshed out for it to really be yeah. needed? Yeah. And I think that Universal's more concise resorts. Like, yeah. We're going to use their biggest resort as an example, obviously. So mm-hmm. Universal Orlando Resort has several hotel clusters, has two gates, and City Walk. And then, of course, it has Volcano Bay. Yeah. Volcano Bay is a little weirdly located, but it's surrounded by hotels. So yeah. from several hotels, it's really easy to get to. And then there is pretty much like a central hub for parking and buses and the Volcano Bay buses that are at the parking structure, which are attached to City Walk. And then the parks are attached to that. Everything is reachable, walking distance within like five minutes from each the other. The use of space at Universal Orlando Resort is so clever. I think it... it, it rivals Disneyland Resort in terms of e- easiness of use and access, and I would say is even more uh, user-friendly than, like, t- Disneyland Paris or Tokyo Disney. It reminds me a lot Tokyo of Disneyland Disney. Paris, and the, re- yeah. the reason I'm saying that is because the hotels are all kind of pushed back a little bit, and yeah. there's walkways or, Very like, true. transportation to get there, but then is there, is that kind of like a triangle of main attractions? Everything connects to the parking yeah. lot. Okay, so I'm going to say Universal Studios Orlando, or sorry, Universal Orlando Resort has parking structure and City Walk are one thing, mm-hmm. right? They're connected, and the buses, all that sort of thing. And then it has one park and a second park. That's like a cluster of three things. Now in Paris, same thing. You've got two parks almost like side by side, right next which, to each other, which is kind of like, like Universal, Universal Orlando Resort. And then you have. Disney Village, which has access to the parking lot, the train station, and the resorts. Disney Village. Pretty much yeah. the same setup. Yeah. And the train station. Well, that's it's the same Oh, you did yeah, say that. Yeah. Sorry, I was just dreaming. It's over train I'm just dreaming yeah. about how amazingly situated Paris's whole setup is, where you take the train from the airport one stop to... Disneyland Paris Resort, and you go up the stairs, and you're there. You're in yeah, the middle or of it. like if you're located two countries away in Amsterdam, you just take a morning train straight to the front gate. Yeah, only Disneyland Paris has that benefit. I don't want to hear anyone complain about that. Yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah anyway, that's not the point. But of this you episode. get more for your time when you have fewer parks with more to do, and the only multi-park resort operation being Universal Orlando Resort is like the perfect. But even looking at setup. like University of Hollywood. The city walk blending with the parking structures, perfect. I love their city Do walk. Do it in o- Osaka. Osaka. Train city station, walk is also city walk, amazing. park. Yeah. Perfect. Um, obviously, we, we've, we've seen Beijing from the sky. It's going to be the same setup pretty yeah. much as, as, Hol- as, uh, as Orlando is going to be. So you're going to have a train station and parking area, giant um, city walk, and then the first park. And then there's space for a second gate and what's rumored to be a Volcano Bay Cologne. You know what's funny is we we're gonna go into this more in a little bit, but like Singapore Universal and Hong Kong Disney are sort of like tit for tat. They're they're each other's response, um, and both of those parks lack a uh, city walk or downtown Disney kind of thing. It's ha- funny. See for Universal Singapore kind of makes sense because it's part of a really it's large part of resorts resort. World. World. Yeah, so it's like, so like a bunch of resorts, shopping, the dining, water malls. park that's like across from it, but it's a resorts world. It's water a unique park. setup for sure. And then, but then Hong Kong Disney is issue is like they they just don't feel like Hong Kong Disney can support downtown Disney. So, and the setup is they all, have no plan and, for it. That's on, soon. sounds like kind of the weird thing. A walk with Hong Kong Disney is like the distance <laughs> between like the hotels, the train station, and the park. It's massive because yeah. it was all meant to be developed, and now yeah. here we are with like walkways yeah. to the jungle. Which it's, I mean, it's it nice, was meant but it's to not, be. It's all kind of infrastructure really set up for like this massive fleshing out of a project, and it's honestly not happening at at any speed or size um, to which they anticipated. Which definitely makes for a unique resort, uh, that's for sure. But yeah, so I think overall resort size, sometimes bigger is not better. Yeah. And I think so far the Universal Resorts, they're all, they're just nicely situated. And one thing that works in Universal's favor is they work a lot with third parties. So like Lowe's runs the hotel in in, in Orlando. Now in Hollywood, you've got several hotels from um, different brands that are literally right on the same upper lot, except for they're not operated by Universal. But you know, you can book ho- you can book resort packages. Still. The Universal Studios Japan hotel setup is same, really same cool. setup yeah. as Hollywood. Like on the other side of City Walk, there's several major, major like tall Universal themed properties 
that everything is really connected and concise. And I think, again, that's really a benefit of the Universal Parks. Like, they are trying to create a cityscape. As, we, as mm-hmm. Disney's approach is more like separation is good. Like, if you want to get to Hotel Cheyenne or if you want to get to... Um, Santa Fe. Santa Fe in Paris, that is not close to the parks. And that is a resort that is meant to be done only by walking. Yeah. Even though, I mean, there are buses for these hotels, but yeah. there's a reason, you know? It's kind of like... And then the same thing for um, Tokyo. Tokyo's setup is really large, and it's not convenient at all. Like, if you want to get from XPRE to the parks, not convenient. You want to get from one park to the other park, didn't even want you to do that. Didn't even sell tickets that allow for that, unless you stay for at least three days. You know, it's stuff like that. Basically, Disney's whole game of, like, park hopping, like... They want to keep you as occupied as possible as long as possible. They want to waste your time on principles so that you'll feel like you need to stay longer. Universal... It's a business model. Yeah. Universal doesn't do that, but... Universal does charge more. Yes. Universal is more expensive. Like, per, per ticket price, per park, Disney across the globe, I actually don't know for sure about Singapore and Hong Kong, but Hong Kong is an expensive place, so is Singapore. I would so assume that maybe it's similar. similar. Uh, but yeah, across the board, Universal does charge more. USJ. For their gates. So yeah, okay, you're not trying to waste your time, but they will park. still make just yeah. as much money on you. Especially with the paid fast pass setup. Definitely. That, which is our next... Uh, our next point here is the general, the operation. So operations wise, I will give general operations to Disney. I'll be upfront with you. I have never experienced operations that piss me off quite as much as I have at some universal parks. Like, yeah, going to USJ and expecting a Tokyo Disney level of uh, operational fortitude was a mistake because I would say USJ is definitely strong ops and good people pushing by the standards of your typical Japanese park, or really by the standards of any normal park. Um, really isn't up to snuff with like Disney's Orlando operate, really any of the Disney parks. Yeah, I was going to give an Universal example parks. is that um, you may have heard this in our, our episodes from like two seasons ago, but when we were at USJ, we had a moment where we kind of got into the realization that the only way for us to do everything we want to do is to spend hard money, like 300 bucks, on additional fast passes. They use, like a, they use a system there where you buy your rides in, or like you buy packages and you have to pick and choose your rides within that package. A little bit com- complicated. I don't want to get into it too much. But we were kind of frustrated because here we are. The park is quite busy. It is really nice weather out in the fall. Like it is just generally a busy period for parks in Asia around that time. And then... We saw them running Flying Dinosaur, their newest spectacular coach that I can run four trains with two trains. Highly frustrating. Yeah. Line was insane. And then we saw Jurassic Park River Adventure with an insane two-hour line running one station. It's stuff like that where I'm like, you are a marquee park. We are paying probably combined like 500 bucks. Yeah. Just to be there for that the day. That is the most we have ever spent. We have never spent more on a theme park than USJ. Admission, and it was, you know? And that was just frustrating to me. And then the fast me. passes on top of I it. I was like, that's kind of ridiculous. And then I feel like a chain like Universal, and USJ is like a household name in Japan. Like, it is a USJ it is, a is one of the top park. five attended parks in the world. and But their operation would not reflect, like, top five in the world level of uh, uh, expeditiousness. So I don't want to give them them the operation price i'll be honest i think operations are fine but disney i feel like i've had a lot more consistency with disney operations at every resort around the world than yeah. i have with universal yeah um but i do want to give them a shout out for their fast pass systems because the thing is with disney if you have free fast pass which everyone loves free fast pass sure um that's a cool system but the problem is that it was getting too advanced to the point where it's like oh well for disney world you get to plan 60 days out and you have to book, you know, and then 50, 30 yeah. days out if you're not even staying on resort. And you have to book your fast passes. The stress and then, of planning okay, so your Disney, Disney World trip is Disney like, will distribute fast pass time slots 60 days out. 60 days out. So much can happen in those 60 days. Okay, the day of operation comes. And suddenly your roller coaster runs with one train less because of a maintenance, you know, a maintenance issue. Great. Now you have distributed fast passes based on fortune operations, and your standby queue becomes three hours. So I'm not saying Disney is perfect, especially not Walt Disney World. And I think that's why the the pass system that Universal has been using for uh, since they introduced it, paid fast pass, easier way to control yeah. the crowds. You know, easier way makes to be, you know? so much sense. Like it's a premium service that you get included when you stay at one of the three um, Cardinal Resort hotels in Orlando. Um, so it's it. I, I feel like 
it's inevitable that Disney World will adopt a similar um, setup for their premium hotels. I mean, the, yeah, I, I think for Disney World, the system we're going to find soon is that it's going to be f- paid fast pass, but maybe like some extra slots for resort yeah. guests as a marketing tactic. Like tiers and like everything. But, you know, we have done a paid fast pass system in Shanghai. It's called Premier it's Pass. Great. Yeah. Great. You can buy packages you want or you buy individual rides and you Paris want. Paris has it too. And in Paris, the same thing. You buy great whatever uh, four packages you want to buy. And we've done it because at the end of the day, if you're going to go to these resorts and travel the world, yeah. I've mentioned this before, not to sound elitist, but if you're going to spend this much money, time, and effort. spending the money to go there. Girl, then, just yeah. make sure you get on everything you yeah. want to get on. Make it count. And you, you came all that way Make and i feel count. like it's easier to get on the stuff you want to get on if you pay for fast passes or whichever way than it is to like rely on a free system and so i prefer the paid setup despite not even liking to spend that much money um, yeah it is at the end of the day i think it works better for those who really want to because it's it. still i mean yeah we're kind of mad about the usj operation situation but it still saved our butts like and i think that the on-site resort benefits for universal this is going to be well disney world yeah. versus universal under resort i think the on-site benefits for universal under resort are slightly better because yeah. you get your early admission Obviously, but you also get your uh, like like I said, if you're staying at the premier or the three premier resorts, which is Portofino Bay, Hard Rock Hotel, Royal or Pacific. Royal Pacific, you get free express pass unlimited included with every day of your stay. Uh, honestly, it's a great selling point. Disney will charge you the same like roughly the same price for roughly the same product. Except but without for a benefit, the, except, like yeah, that benefit like that with like the unlimited. And a benefit pass. used to be like getting to book. 60 days out versus yeah. 30 days out. But that benefit doesn't exist right now. It's very universal. It does. Disney, and we don't even yeah. know what we're going to replace it with. So as of right now, right that now, edge goes to universal. Right now, on-site Disney resort benefits are deteriorating. They're they're disappearing right out from under Yeah, us. so fun. Staying in a monorail resort, but not being able to take the monorail to Epcot because yeah. they haven't cared about opening it up. Yeah, <laughs> or okay. like staying uh, at a Skyliner resort, but the wait for a Skyliner it's is like an hour. An hour. <laughs> like, it's, it's insanity. But, yeah, yeah, I mean... Um, so yeah, next up is going to be oh the this is mood okay. Slash this feel. is something that I think we we were thinking about this and then our Instagram responses we got a lot of answers that reminded us of this point which was that the the feel like the, the I guess the aesthetic well okay so I guess we're gonna I'm gonna bring it back down all the way to like approach yeah okay um so the approach of Disney has been like magic fantasy wonder yeah. and then you hear it everywhere. And then for Universal, the approach has always been based more out of, like, action. So yeah. it's been, like, action, you know, destruction, saving the planet. I mean, you know it. You've been on the Universal ride. You know that you have to save something or something is going on. I the whole world's Universal about to get destroyed, you know? I think Universal Studios Resort adjectives are almost film franchises. Epic. You have thrills. Awesome. Thrill. Action. Like, you know, <laughs> it's all a lot more... Ad- Things are teen adults. attractions are suspenseful, and Disney and tries to things are high stakes. I feel like Disney tries to okay, so both of them tactic adult audiences, but then Disney wants adult audiences and young kids, yeah, and then Universal wants adult audiences and, and like, like teenagers. teenagers. And I think those are different approaches, but it's fun because it sets these resorts apart so much because you will never see Disney build a roller coaster themed to running with a raptor, as where. Even though they have to step up their game a little bit, and there are some thrilling Disney kills out there, Universal yeah. isn't afraid to put a thrilling ride out that looks like a thrilling ride. Because I mean, that's their product. Their product Disney is Disney World built, uh, begrudgingly, I think, built a looping coaster in 1999 to combat Islands of Adventure. And that's it. That's your looping coaster for the entire resort. Yeah. It's just fucking hell. Oh, sorry. It's just, <laughs> hilar- <laughs> it's just hilarious to me <laughs> that one. Disneyland <laughs> Paris... It's three looping roller coasters. And that's half of all of Disney's parks. looping coasters are and the all rest, in Paris. The other three are spread out around the rest of the world, and they are marketed as some sort of like high thrill, crazy ride, even yeah. though they're absolutely not. Paris is the one resort where like you really do need to do Disney, even if you're not a Disney person, because you have to go to get the coasters. Yeah, people if are you're a coaster really confused person, why I care so much, but that, that resort is like cool coasters. If you're a coaster person cool and you're like, uh, Disney's not coaster-centric, I would say, first of all, that there's good Disney coasters at every resort, and second of all, Disneyland Paris is coaster centric yeah it is the coaster, coaster forward um, yeah it's like between yeah. this this paris resort and universal under resort it's funny how many parallels they have yeah. now i talk about this because yeah. they both have like really 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 solid coaster yeah. collections and they both have like a similar resort setup. it's ironic because i think the fiasco that was euro disney resort is exactly why universal uh didn't want a lot of 
money in the European market game. That's what it pulled out so quickly which after is acquiring Port Aventura. experimented with Port yeah. Aventura, and it ended as quickly as it began. And I think they really dodged a bullet with that. Yeah. We'll be talking more about that. Though I think long, yeah. I think long term, because when they acquired that project, they were young. Yeah. It, they acquired a project before Universal Studios Japan was a thing. They acquired the project. Bef- and, like, Universal Orlando you know, Resort was just getting off the ground. Like, Islands of Adventure. It was definitely not, like, was, a smash hit success start yeah. for that resort either. Islands of Adventure Hollywood kind of, kind of was literally, like, start. two rides in a studio tour. Yeah. So back when Port Aventura, they had Port Aventura. They weren't ready for Port Aventura. Yeah. I think if they were to have hold on to it, it would have been a really fun Really fun situation in Europe with having a universal yeah. park there. And I hope maybe one day they'll enter that market. But it is a really tacky, uh, not tacky, it's like a really hard market to tackle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You it's, know, it's, there's so much competition. A, and your name does not save tight you. tight market. Your name doesn't sell tickets as yeah. quickly as you think it would. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, resort-wise, it just depends. This is honestly a preference. But I do want to say that where, as for Disney, uh, sorry, as for Universal could have copied the product that existed, as so many other entities have tried, they did really find their own niche. And I think that's something that needs to be celebrated. They have franchise. I mean, they acquire a bunch of franchises, but when they have acquired them, it's such they a great with them, you know? collage they did a good job. of things that you can see and experience uh, between the Universal parks. And I, I do, I, like, the, the mood, I think Universal has a more playful, animated kind of energy about it. Um, things tend to be a little bit more larger than life. Disney kind of has this reputation of being a bit more refined. I think at the end of the day, everything in Disney kind of feels like fantasy. Even at Epcot, even though it's meant to be real Everything life. is princesses and castles. That's and where I think at Universal, it's like, it just feels a little more real. Yeah. It's kind of hard to put this to words, I guess, because that's where we literally wrote down feel slash mood on our, on yeah. our sheet here. Because we're like, how do we explain that? But I think, if I have to say it a certain way, it's I think at Disney will always take like a fantasy sparkly approach to everything, whether it's the space theme, whether, you know, as we're universal. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say, okay, you have a space theme. Universal is going to be like, shit's wrong. Yeah. The world's going to blow it's gonna up. It's going to be we sci- need your help. sci-fi city Let's at Universal go. Singapore. With right? Battlestar Battle Galactica. Galactica. That's, that's honestly a very bloody franchise. It's a high it stakes premise. Yeah, it is. Like, it is literally like is humanity intense. versus the robot, you yeah. know, versus artificial intelligence. And then, Universe, uh, Disney will be like, oh, space. We're going to space. Super cute. Woo. Look at this cute music. Star, star, star. Oh, my God. There's another rock. I mean, this is super cute. There have been times where Universal or when Disney dabbled in Universal style, ser- like extraterrestrial alien encounter. It just didn't work for them. But it just, yeah. yeah. I feel like when Disney tries to imitate Universal, they fall flat on their face. And I think that brings us very conveniently to our next point about Universal Studios Hollywood and its the studio tour, which is... Well, we actually have a couple points before that. We've got price and value. Well, we talked about this. We talked about planning already. No, we talked about our operations, which include the fast Yeah, but you, we brought up the part about restaurant reservations and fast pass and planning the 60 days out, 30 oh, days out. Looks so. like we're running ahead of ourselves in yeah. my, our little sheet here. Might be. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that brings us to the next point. Is like imitation is dangerous because... <laughs> Here's Disney. Okay, so I guess we'll start with Universal Studios Hollywood, the original studio yeah, theme the park. OG. This park is located on a hill in one of the world's largest Hollywood movie Hills, working man. studios. And then they had a studio tour to go see the studios, and then the theme park was kind of born out of that. And then it was obviously themed to movies and franchises, that sort of thing. Now, Disney was like, well, this is great. This is super successful. Yeah. Love that for them. Yeah. And then Universal announced that we're going to build Universal Studios Florida. And that's when Disney had a little bell ring and said, well, if you can do it, yeah. if you can build another one of those, we can do it too. And I think that was really dangerous because that's how Walt Disney Studios Paris happened. That's how MGM Studios slash Disney's Hollywood Studios happened. And, and in a way, that's how California Hollywood Adventure Hollywood Land, happened. California Adventure, and all three times it was like... Every single time they've attempted it, it failed. And it's taken over 20 years to fix. I mean, Walt Disney Studios and still all, isn't fixed. Every studio aspect of... Any given Disney resort, whether it's Anaheim, Paris, or Orlando, the studio tour aspect, the back lot and stuff, remains a identity crisis. Only at the Universal Parks does it not feel like pretending, like it feels deliberate and thought out. Universal Florida may not actually be doing a whole lot of studio stuff these days, but they certainly held on to the actual functioning studio aspect of their park design longer and more authentically than MGM Studios did. 
which like Disney tried really hard to to it was a it was a square peg round hole thing where they're like we need a studio park it needs to be a functioning studio we need to have stuff being filmed here so that we can tell people on the tram tour that stuff was filmed here and it just it just wasn't a good fit and within 10 years the whole functionality of the studio just stopped meanwhile you have Universal Orlando Resort which didn't even seem to concern itself that much with the whole functioning studio aspect they seemed to have a much more gen- because they didn't try to recreate the studio tour they had a studio tour but it was very different on principle and it didn't last very long because it was going through public midways and stuff so that kind of came and went but more importantly i went uh, Universal Orlando Florida was about building fully fleshed out theme park rides in the tradition of studio tram tour experiences. And in that way, it was never about like, oh, we have to have a functioning studio in order for this to work and it has to be authentic. Universal Orlando. I think Disney wanted to have a functioning studio as part of like a studio theme park so incredibly badly that they spent all the money and efforts in moving studios from Burbank to Florida just so they could build a theme park yeah. around it. And honestly, and if, that's you have where, to, if, and if you have to stretch the money, if you have to stretch, if you have to stretch an idea so far and, and have to do so much just so you have the basics and just have the foundation of the idea i don't know what they were thinking yeah and i don't even know why they were thinking this several times i guess university of hollywood is really popular because it is a working movie studio you are going to hollywood yeah that you're is, in hollywood you are selling tickets because you're in hollywood to go i don't to, know why disney thinks that putting to, a fake studio in a you know, in yeah. a wetland in Paris is going to make it popular. I just never understood. I feel like by their the time idea. because Studios Paris and California Adventures Studio area happened at the same time, and they happened for the same reason. It's a good budgetary looking thing. Totally. Uh, every time Disney does the studios thing, it feels like a budget move. Whereas when Universal builds a new park, it doesn't feel like a budgetary move. Speaking of budgets, bring this to our next This is another good segue. Wow, we Um, didn't even plan this. Universal (laughs) Creative has been coming for Disney ever since. It's always been an uphill battle. They are Because Disney has the name, Disney has the money, Disney has the... Notoriety... The Disney, size of Disney the resorts. I mean, Disney. Disney pretty much invented Orlando. I mean, you know, they have about the films, modern Orlando. The nostalgia. They own the most media. So you're going to get to the point where it's like Universal is out for blood. So the moment that Disney even, like, you know, takes a breather for one second, Universal will swoop in and do something. I mean, a good point, a good moment to say that is that Disney just recently announced that they're going to invest less in their theme parks. And literally a week later, Universal's like, all right, great. We're going to put Epic, Epic Universe, Universe back, back on track. Online, 2025. Like, well, that's great. Yeah. And then they did it, you know, while Disney was getting stagnant, Universal was kind of, you know, going through it with, uh, um, with the 2007, 2008, uh, 2009 recession. recession. And they acquired Potter because Universe, Disney was giving, you know, J.K. Rowling and Warner Bros. Studios too much crap and didn't quite want to invest as much in the Harry Potter project. And Universal put all their money where their mouth was and they built whatever, you know, whatever J.K. wanted. And boom, here we go. Universal Creative's flexibility in working with other groups was how they won that round because Disney is so determined to do things their way, they let Harry Potter slip through their fingers by trying to conduct the project to, without enough of input from the people who really mattered, which was J.K. Rowling, Warner Brothers, people who designed the sets for the films came in and, did all and of it built for Universal. Wizarding yeah. World of Harry Potter. So Universal did less and got more because they let the right people take the reins. Every time Disney announces that they're about to rein in the theme park project because they need to cut budgets, Universal comes through and just annihilates the game with fact, some we're even, massive... We're even getting to the point where like the tables are turning because now Universal designs products and Disney comes back and tries to do it on their own. Same thing. A um, good example is Wizarding World of Harry Potter... And Galaxy's Edge. People don't necessarily want to draw that parallel, but I'm not afraid to because we've got, you know, Islands of Adventure, when they opened Universal, oh, sorry, when they opened the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, it was revolutionary. It was a highly themed area with a incredibly advanced dark ride that had beautiful sets, 
amazing technology, where the queue was part of the experience. You had a signature drink from the movies. You had experiences like the, you know, like, oh, oh yeah. Vendor's one of our, Shop. One of our Instagram responses, actually, which we love, is from uh, Instagram user max.f.bo. Uh, articulated this beautifully. He's like, Universal revolutionized themed entertainment with Wizarding World of Harry Potter. He, they did, and then Universal turns around and creates Galaxy's Edge. Disney which, turns around. And sorry, yeah, yeah. Disney turns around, creates Galaxy's Edge with a you know, marquee attraction that is a, a physical dark ride yeah. with you know, a spectacular queue setup, yeah. which they interpreted a little bit differently, and uh, making it with a special drink. The blue and green milk. Too much of it. All these, was, like, all these little things are just like direct reactionary reactions. call and response. And again, like like with the studio tour, like with anything that Disney with like extraterrestrial alien encounter. Every time Disney tries to do something that reads too much, like a response to Universal, it, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work pan out. out. Because I feel like they're so focused on doing directly what they did, but on their own way. And I'm like, you know. Your Disney's best projects are the projects that are 100 percent their own idea, and you don't get a lot of that sometimes. Um, but okay, that's not the point of this episode. But yeah, I think Universal Creative just jumps in when they have an opportunity. I'm not saying they're perfect because stuff like Fast and Furious Supercharged <laughs> exists, and it really, 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 really shouldn't yeah. exist. But and even they know that. <laughs> I mean, that's why they still did it. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm also want to give a shout out to them for coming in and doing things. The right way, making a name for themselves. Because, I mean, it really used to be Universal's quality wasn't nearly as high as Disney's quality. And now they're fighting for the best quality. Now we're fighting. Now it's really an equal fight between Universal and Disney. Who they're, can put the best ride out They the rise to the occasion every time. And they do things that surprise me, always. Disney used to be full of surprises. And we still get surprises from Disney. But Universal just is so off the wall sometimes. Like... When the Born Stunt Spectacular opened, like I didn't know what to expect, and then I saw it, and I was like, "This is really different. Like, this is cool." Uh, you know what? I mean, I, we don't have a bullet point for this, but I want to mention shows. Universal being so fo- you know, being so based on the whole movie production side of things from the get go, they have some of the most spectacular shows on earth. Waterworld is still like the highest guest satisfaction attraction at Universal Studios Hollywood. It is so incredibly spectacular. Stuff like that you wouldn't see at Disney. Disney isn't going to blow up stadiums just, you know, because that's not their product. But I do think that Universal has something that yeah, only Disney's a high money, like only a high money company can put that sort of production on display. And it's just not Disney. It's Disney's Universal. Disney's reaction to that was Lights, Motors, Action. And we all know how that went. <laughs> um, next up is the... Um, Opportunist growth, um, as you wrote that on our paper, which I Oppor- think is kind of like uh, similar. opportunistic. It's, yeah, that kind of plugs into what we were saying. Not even just about Universal. I feel like every time Disney responds to Universal, it's kind of a mistake. Whereas every time Universal responds to Disney, like brilliance happens and, and I they get because, closer and closer. And I think it's because Universal realizes that what they're trying to do is going to be their own thing. Yeah. Uh, because Universal knows, okay, well, Disney's going to build Tron and Guardians, but they're going to they're gonna make it look like it's not a roller coaster. And it's sort of yeah. like really cute looking space thing. But so uh, instead, you know, this, Universal's yeah. like, well, we're not afraid to make a roller coaster that seems to blasting out of a raptor paddock, chasing dinosaurs. You know, like they're not afraid to kind of have that thrilling edge in like the more extreme or edge. even like they know they can do it. They're like, you know, we don't mind that this roller coaster is a roller coaster because we are attracting amusement park fans right. who love roller coasters. Um, not only that, I think there's been pretty much for as long as Universal has been growing their brand, they have always kind of been a step behind Disney in terms of like their growth plan. Which, for a lot of people, is kind of why Universal is underestimated. Obviously, like, the number of parks and the size of their footprint versus Disney's is something that people talk about when comparing the resorts. But, I mean, obviously, Universal has had their uh, their their sights set on the theme park world industry for... They haven't been going at it for as long as Disney has. So, like, yeah. I mean, they didn't build a second park until 1990. By that point, Disney already had flourishing resorts in three countries or uh, sorry in three regions almost four countries um but every time that disney does something universal's watching and universal has been able to learn from the mistakes that disney made i like to think that islands of adventures business model of build everything 
right out the gate and have the most killer opening day roster ever is exactly what you learn from park rollouts like Epcot, like and I'm okay them, like Hollywood Studios, like Walt Disney Studios, like, like Disney California Adventure. Adventure. Oh my god! You and know, Disney like makes all of those. Disney will make the same mistake. Over and over and over. I look forward to seeing what they're adding to Disney in Shanghai. When they built Hong Kong Disney, it was like, how many times are you going to undercut your Loki, own Hong product? Kong Disney's a whole different story because that is just a giant f up. Yeah, I love the park, but there's so much that went wrong. There's so much that they could they should uh, yeah. differently. Nowhere is the differences between Disney and Universal highlighted better than the difference between Hong Kong Disney and Universal Studios Singapore. They're five years apart, so. I mean, Universal Studios Singapore they both think about, wasn't they even... They both kind of take the same spot yeah. in, like, the lineup yeah, of, like, they're natural in the, additions. Yeah, the, they're in, like, the Oceania, Southeast Asia market. Where there's a lot of money, because Singapore is... <laughs> people yeah. in Singapore are rich, and same... Hong Kong, it's, it's an incredibly high value But with Hong too. Kong Disney, Disney was so exasperated by the fiasco that was Euro Disney, which, like we said, Universal's uh, response to Euro Disney was to not get involved, and... Their cash flow liquidity, as a result, was was spared from that fate. Um, and then Disney built Hong Kong Disney, and it's this four hour tops, you know, diversion. If that, yeah. I mean, when Hong Kong Disney opened, there was not jack shit to do, and everything there was just a, a cut and paste from other parks. Like there was no risks taken. It was absolutely the safest easiest path of least resistance and of course they got reamed by it attendance was terrible um the hong kong government's like what the hell like you need to fix this so the rescue the stim- the rescue stimulus for hong kong disney was the three area expansion um which finally brought the park some unique attractions a full roster but that took it took 10 years for hong kong disney to emerge as this like fully realized project which again is is just the mistake that disney makes over and over again Universal Studios Singapore, I mean, aside from the fact that Battlestar Galactica had technical problems and was on and offline periodically for the first few years, Universal Singapore came to play. Uh, Transformers debuted with that park, which was a huge, huge, huge deal. Battlestar Galactica being this... Uh, updated re- react like an updated like a, a, a hybrid between Incredible Hulk and Doing Dragons, incredible major marquee attraction with a really unique theme. Right at the other side of the lagoon, so when you come into the park, kind of what Fosco is doing for Island of Adventure. Now you come into the park, you look clear across the lake, and you see this roller coaster like just drawing you. Yeah, uh, which is I mean, cool. and these are two attractions in one area of the in one area of the park. Sci Fi City, Sci Fi City is cool. Kills the yeah. game. And then they've got unique attractions everywhere, unique areas. The Madagascar area and Ride, which is actually being retired now for, for newer stuff. But at the time, it was like, this is interesting. This is something they've never done before. Um, this copying of their Their Jurassic the Park River Adventure is a rapids ride that is totally unique with, like, a completely different story and situation. Like, everything about it is different from the three existing Jurassic Park River Adventures that were already built. They have a one-of-a-kind Sesame Street dark ride that I am so envious of. Like, there has never well, been... yeah, they've got the Puss in Boots um, the Puss, the roller giant coaster journey. dark ride, yeah. That is... I mean, there has never been a hesitation for Universal to put completely unique attractions. Yeah, that, it doesn't always pan out, but Universal doesn't necessarily rely on what worked and just yeah. puts everywhere, except for, obviously, the high-value things like Potter... Because, like, they spend so much money on that. They may well, yeah, well clone I mean, it. It, it's too successful to not clone it. Yeah. And then, like, rides like The Mummy, for example. Mummy was a safe bet for, for Singapore. So they, But they added a whole mummy area with, like, a, a supporting family ride where you're, like, on little Humvees and stuff. Like, and this is why I'm so excited to see Universal Studios Beijing open because Shanghai was almost, like, a response to what universal have been doing is like adding a bunch of unique stuff so like universal made a really unique park in singapore and so disney's next move was okay well or shanghai park yeah. is gonna have to be unique it's gonna yeah. have to have stuff that none of the other the parks don't have and so despite there still being some copies universe uh, shanghai disneyland really is one of those gates where disney got it right i'll be honest um, and but i also think yeah. that was really great because that was almost like a response to singapore and now universal's opening their beijing resort which is going to be competing much yeah. more directly finally it was you like know? finally disney uh learned something from universal and it didn't seem like an imitation 
like the, they finally learned their lesson of like, well, maybe we should take the Disneyland Paris approach again and like flesh out our main gate uh, to the nines and what happens happens. And then Universal Beijing is like, okay, like, yeah, we're going to play that game because we invented that game. Like, exactly. We're going to kill it. And I think for Universal Beijing, it's going to be fun to see unique Jurassic World rides, um, unique Minion rides, seeing a unique Transformer setup where you're going to have the Transformers ride, but it's going to have a Transformers roller coaster. It is going to be fun to see, like, Universal and um, Park in China and Disney's Park in China kind of, like, going head to head. And I think that that is a perfect display of Disney and Universal being on the same level and it mm-hmm. coming down to a preference. Very Disney true. isn't better than Universal. They are on the same playing field now. And I think that needs to get in people's heads. And as a travel agent, we notice that people are like always kind of like drawn directly to Disney. But Universal has really, really good products, really cool products. Price points are similar. I think... That depending on what you look at, which we kind of focus on Universal's highlight and our best points, just to kind of help show people there are on the same level. Mm-hmm. Disney and Universal have a lot in common, but Disney does sometimes do things better. And sometimes, as we've showed today, Universal does things better. Um, and that's just kind of the point of this whole episode, I, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to finish up, there was some more really great um, responses that we got from Instagram talking about, because we asked people, like, if you like Universal better, if you're a Universal person, why? Um, a lot of people said they think the, the thrill rides and variety of ride types are better. Disney obviously doesn't really push too hard in the thrill sector, but Universal comfortably builds family-friendly rides, things that would work really well in the Disney setting, but then also really intense, I like, mean, yeah, high-profile thrill coasters. Think about, it. Th- think about it. They have a hyper-coaster in Japan. They've got a flying coaster in Japan. They have three major, major, major launch coasters in one gate here in yeah. Florida. And then they have, of course, um, Hollywood River Rocket. They've got the mummies. I mean, it's fire, launches. It's all kind of really intense stuff mm-hmm. like compared to Disney anyway. Yeah, the most intense coasters at Disney are kind of like middle-range. And if you're going to think about Port de Ventura once upon a time, <laughs> that was a pretty <laughs> lit coaster yeah. collection for yeah, one that part open. Other, and then other people also, a lot of people said that they just like the intellectual properties better uh, at Universal. If you get Disney burnout, easy. Um, if you have MCU burnout, I feel like it can be feeling, it can feel really refreshing um, to explore Universal's uh, collection of, of characters and places and stuff um, when you're in this very Disney-dominated uh, media environment like we are. Um, and then other people, I, I, to, to expound on the, the thrill ride options at Disney, people, of course, or at, at Universal, people, of course, coaster enthusiasts, because most of our followers are very coaster-centric. So if you're a coaster enthusiast, you're generally going to have a better time at Universal. Better coasters, um, usually better, even better dark rides for a lot of people. Um, Rise of the Resistance, of course, is incredible, but Universal... Every decade, Universal does yeah, something crazy Yeah, a lot of Universal's dark rides, dark rides are a lot larger because a lot newer. And so the ones that survived are bigger, high profile, maybe even more high tech. It's where like, a lot of the Disney dark rides that we're still familiar with are like old school, like boat rides or are they, you know, like a small fancy land ride. So Universal's dark rides, there really aren't many rides like that. You have um, Cat in the Hat. That's the only one I can think of that's really kind of like, like a, a fantasy yeah. land style. Dark ride. Because then you think, like, for every decade, you've got some, uh, like, outrageous Disney or ra- outrageous Universal uh, dark ride phenomenon. Because, like, when the, resor- when the Florida resort opened in 1990, you had, like, Confrontation and Earthquake, which were cutting edge, spectacular. Uh, and then 10 years later, you've got things at Islands of Adventure. Spider Man still remains one of the most impressive leaps in dark ride technology and, and, Execution, And then an, another 10 years, you have uh, Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Forbidden Journey, which we still would argue is, like, the best overall uh, ride in Florida. Yeah, uh, I would say so. Even but after, even after, kind of even after 10 years, there's just something about the way the ride, like, that ride system is still so enigmatic. And I know that we mentioned Thrill and, like, more adult audiences – quite a bit this episode and it all kind of comes back to the fact that Universal has one thing that Disney will never have never and that is a signature world class leading like world leading 
Special events. The best. Halloween Horror Night Halloween uh, presented Horror at, I think, currently all resorts. Thank you, uh, you uh, I Love Reina Twerkas, because you were the only person to say that Halloween Horror Nights was why you liked Universal better. Even though I think if we asked a lot of people... Like, they'd be like, oh yeah, of They'd course, be like, yeah, yeah. like what right is away. the one thing that makes Universal strong against Disney? What's something that Universal has that Disney will never have? Because Disney goes in a totally different direction. It has to be for kids. It has to be trick-or-treating. It has to... Not so scary. Disney party is... I mean, it's really fun. It's really cute. It has its place, but there's just... Halloween but Horror Nights is scale, a events like that global exists everywhere. phenomenon. As for, and there no is one can nothing quite do like it the it. way Halloween Horror Nights does it. And Scary Farm. But, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. These are uh, just a couple ways in which Universal stands out. I think... That they're on a level equal playing field. I mean, there's been times where I liked my Disney Day better. There's been times where I like my Universal Day better. Disney has more to choose from, but it also copies a lot. Yeah. And so that's why I'm just drawn to like attractions that are a little more unique, um, including obviously for myself Hyperspace Mountain and uh, and Tron. But then Universal does that a lot more. Like Universal doesn't have Big Thunder Mountain in four parks. No, Universal has a different types of Jurassic Park coasters, mm-hmm. different themes for the. I mean, they have a Battlestar. Even their mummies coaster. are all different. Yeah, so that's just that's just kind of like a cool way that even though they do copy and there are some copies of Dark Rides, um, not nearly as much as Disney does it. So that's another thing to remember. But even yeah. in this era of COVID nineteen and handling the pandemic, we one person uh, in particular, IPC fifty two on Instagram, uh, said that they think Universal is handling the pandemic better and that was tipping the scales for them that their 2020 and 2021 experiences at Universal were better than Disney's based on the way um, that the pandemic is being handled and I think I, I think once again Universal rises to the challenge um, in ways that are unexpected and people are taking notice 100% and hopefully you take notice too um we were thinking of doing an episode for Disney, but realized, you know what? Yeah. Disney are people know Disney. Yeah. Disney has that name. We gas up Disney all the time. Um, and this was just we, we wanted to take a moment and say like, hey guys, um, you know what? Universal, honestly, litty titty as well. Like they do everything <laughs> right. And um, this both have their flaws, both have things in which they really stand out. But Universal deserves just as much credit, if sometimes not more, than Disney. Hundred percent. That's that. Absolutely. We'll catch you on next episode. Thank you for listening, guys. Have a good day. Catch you next time.